this is Anna McCain. Our visiting author today is Andrew Clements. Mr. Clements is the author of over 60 children's books, including the wildly popular Friendall and the New York Times best-selling No Talking and Lunch Money. He's also an award-winning author with honors to his name, such as the Christopher Award and the Edgar Award. His latest chapter book series is called Benjamin Pratt and the Keepers of the School, and the first book in the series, entitled We the Children, is in stores now. Andrew, welcome to Off the Shelf. Thank you very much. Congratulations on We the Children. It's an office favorite in the children's division right now. Can you give our audience a brief description of the book? Benjamin Pratt and the Keepers of the School is a history mystery adventure series. The main character is trying to save something that he loves. He loves his school. Part of the reason he loves his school is because it is very old. He loves old things. He's a kid that just always had an idea about history. Um, the sort of kid who would find arrowheads lying around the fields in Massachusetts. The kind of kid who would go to antique shops and pick up an old hammer and say, I wonder who used this thing. Um, the school is under attack. He is, uh, you know, it, it's sort of like the future is waging a battle against the past and it looks like the future is going to win. A large company that makes mock historical theme parks has decided that the site of his very old school that has been a school 50 feet away from the Atlantic Ocean since the year 1783, a company has decided that this will be a perfect place for their new big theme park called Tall Ships Ahoy, a nautical theme park. And at the beginning of book one, the school was slated for demolition in 30 days. And a series of events, circumstances, moments happen. And Ben suddenly finds himself uh, being asked to do everything he can to keep the school from being torn down. It's great. It's one of my favorite books I've been working on this year. And uh, my next question for you is, uh, because of the premise of the book, um, Ben Pratt, Saving the School, essentially built in 1783, is that inspired by your love of history as well? It's, it's very deep-seated in the book. It's hard not to think that you are also a, his a history lover. Well, I'm not really a historian, but I do love old things. Some of my earliest happy memories are rooting around in old antique shops in Cornish, Maine. We used to go to a place called Hiram, Maine, a pond there called Barker Pond when I was a kid. And on rainy days and sometimes on sunny days, anytime I got to that, to these towns where there'd be an antique shop. And these antique shops weren't, you know, they weren't like fancy little shops. These were basically people's houses and people's barns places where there was just a lot of old junk lying around and people walked around and put price tags on the old junk and I would just get to go in and kind of look at, at these things that were basically the leftovers and the artifacts, the objects, the tools, uh, the weapons, uh, artwork once in a while, just all this amazing stuff from other people's lives. And, um, and that is, uh, you know, I think where uh, my love of history really began, just kind of looking, poking through the stuff left over from lives lived long ago. And do you still collect now, or did, do you have items that you purchased as a child that have survived with you? I have pen knives that my grandfather gave to me, which his father and grandfather gave to him. I have hammers, I have tools, I have uh, old fountain pens, all sorts of old things that, that I, uh, you know, I, I don't think of myself as a collector as much of, uh, as much as I do a, a user of old things. If I buy an old hammer, sooner or later, it's, I'm going to beat on something with, with, <laughs> with it. It, it, it. These things get used in my life. I don't just, uh, you know, uh, they're not say, there for show. They're not there for show. I don't have them on display. I don't have display cases. You know, I, I um, 
uh, on the wall in the writing shed in my backyard, a little 10 by 12 garden shed that I've converted into a quiet place where I can sit and think and write. Um, I have uh, just right in front of my desk, just because it's a neat artifact, a neat old thing, I have a hammer um, that was used once upon a time to make shoes. It was, it's a cobbler's hammer. And um, I, I'm sure that it dates back to the early 1800s, maybe even a little sooner than that. It's, it's, it's an old thing. And I just enjoy looking at it. I, lo I enjoy seeing these old things and thinking about the hands that held them, the work that was done, the thought that went into actually making the tool. Um, because these are tools that weren't made in big factories. These are tools that were made uh, in blacksmith shops, tools that were made uh, by men and women to meet a particular need at a particular moment in their history. So, so they tell a story themselves. They have their own little histories right, right attached, yes. Well, let's talk about this shed for a moment because I know you spend a lot of time there, but it sounds to me like it's a pretty fancy shed. Well, uh, it's not a garden shed anymore. It, it, you know, it's not a place where you just kind of wheel your, wheel your lawnmower in and shut the door and, until next week. It, it is a, um, uh, it is a pine paneled, ten by twelve space with a skylight in the roof, and an air conditioner through the wall for the summer months. A little wood stove in the corner for the f corner for the winter months. Uh, a microwave. A, um, a, uh, a little tiny refrigerator, a, uh, a cot, a place to lie down and sleep that actually hangs from the ceiling above my desk and I can kind of unhook it and set it up if, I, if it's getting to be three or four in the morning and I don't want to wake up anyone in the house by coming in, I'll just lie down and sleep there after I'm done writing. Um, so it's sort of like a little lifeboat, really. Yeah, uh, a retreat. A retreat, a place to go and sit and think. Um, the biggest part of writing is thinking, and every writer I know spends a lot of time just sitting, thinking, trying to figure out what happens next. That is the question when you're writing, what happens next? Well, I know that you were largely inspired by your parents to be a good reader and to enjoy books. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that and maybe other influences in your childhood to, that have helped you become who you are today? Well, it's certainly true that my mom and dad uh, made sure that, uh, that, along with my brothers and sisters, that I had plenty of books growing up. They were part of standard equipment in our home. Um, you know, it's wonderful to visit a library, and, and libraries and bookstores are great places to go and test drive books, uh, but there's nothing like actually owning books yourself. And uh, I often have shown uh, people a copy I have of uh, The Wind in the Willows. And if you flip the front page op open, uh, in my mom's handwriting, you see, To Andrew Clements, with love from mother and dad, Christmas 1959. They made sure that books were part of our everyday lives. And, um, and if it weren't for that, I I'm sure I would not have grown up to be uh, you know, to be interested in stories, to be interested in the way words work on paper. And uh, if, if that had not been part of my history, I don't think I would have turned into the writer I am. And you also had a special English teacher that pushed you toward becoming a writer. Is that I right? did. I, I do. Yes. Um, when I was in 12th grade, you see, when I was going to school, writing is not taught. It wasn't taught in the same way that it's taught today. It wasn't taught as intensively. It wasn't taught as, as uh, persistently, I think, as it is today. And um, Mrs. Rappel, when I was in 12th grade, uh, senior year in high school in Springfield, Illinois, Mrs. Rappel was my English teacher. And um, she believed I was a good writer. Uh, she gave me some good grades. She told me one time that this poem I had written should be published. And that really changed the way I thought about myself as a writer. It made me feel like I was a good writer. Sent me off to college interested 
more interested in actually not just reading because I'd always loved reading but in actually trying to write myself trying to um, to get the words to behave on the paper and um, I studied English literature I wrote a lot of papers for my professors and every once in a while a professor would write back and say Andrew this is a very well written paper you're a very good writer um, and all those little things were kind of you know encouragement along the way um, for most people and I am one of those most people for most people writing is hard work it, it's something that takes time takes effort uh, and uh, and without the a, a person or two uh, who looks at something you've written and says, you know, this is good. I think you have potential. Teachers are in such a great spot to be able to help those students who, who have potential to become better writers. Everyone has a potential to become a better writer. Um, but every once in a while, and I know this from my own experience as a teacher, uh, I taught fourth grade for two years, eighth grade English for three years, high school English for two years. During that time, you know, it was my responsibility to help everyone become at least a competent writer but once in a while you get a student who really has a special flair who has a sense of style who has a sense of voice and uh, you have a special responsibility I think as a teacher or a parent or a friend when someone when you spot someone who writes well let them know tell them so because it does make a difference to have someone say you know this is really good do you hear from your past students at all now that You've got a pretty popular name in chapter books. Um, I would say probably three or four times in the last eight or nine years, I'll open up a letter and it will be from someone I taught either in high school or junior high school or even in fourth grade. And these people are now having children of their own. Their children are now reading my books and they say I looked at this picture on the back flap of, and and there you were it, it looks similar to this English teacher <laughs> are you Mr. Clements who taught in Wilmette Illinois are you Mr. Clements who taught here and uh, of course I write back and say yes this is so great it's fun to get back in touch I and it's remarkable sometimes they will send me you know just reading their name and I will be able to see in my mind's eye I'll be able to see the student they used to be in my classroom uh, through all those years. Um, memory is a wonderful thing when it works. That's pretty remarkable. You've taught quite a few students. Well, I figured that out once. I, you know, I, my, my, first, um, my first year, I think I had exactly 30 students, 18 boys and, and 12 girls uh, in fourth grade. Next year was maybe 28 students. The year after that, I was teaching in a junior high school. So I had three or four sections that added up to 105 students that year. All told, during seven years, I taught about 700 kids. You know, high school, again, large classes, a number of sections. About 700 kids. And um, it is remarkable, that, you know, that, uh, that some of them just, you know, still, I, I can just picture these kids. Actually, I still get a lot of my writing ideas for my stories about kids and teachers in schools from my own experience as a teacher. Well, it's a, it, an interesting part of your books is it just really transforms the reader into, I, when I was reading it, I couldn't help but think back into the sixth grade. And that's, it's a pretty remarkable talent to be able to do something like that, which is what makes you so popular on the fourth floor at Simon & Schuster. But now that we've talked all about the first book, is there anything you want to share with our listeners about what could be to come in this six book series? Well, um, I think all I should say at this point is that the mysteries that and the clues that are, that are uh, revealed in book number one, they all lead places. They, I think they're going to lead into some fairly unexpected places. Um, and, uh, and, and I hope that, uh, I hope the readers will stay curious and keep asking questions because there are things, things will happen. Things will be found, unexpected things. 
Well, it's quite a cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Anna. We the Children, the first book of Benjamin Pratt and the Keepers of the School series, is published by the Athenaeum imprint of Simon & Schuster's Children Division. You can find out more about Andrew Clemens' new book at simonandschuster.com. Thank you.